Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. We wear a lot of masks as men, you know, to try to fit in. What we try to do is to try to encourage guys to take the mask off and get comfortable with who you really are. They stick to their role, we stick to our role. And it is a little weird. Sometimes you kind of wonder, you know, oh, that's right, we're just, we're just acting here. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. You don't really see fathers these days, you know, in their child's life, or, or if they are, they don't shine no light, you know. So I'm just here, you know, to for all the real dads out there. Today we're going to talk to a mentor in our community who works closely with fathers, some who are incarcerated, to support them through challenging times and help them to be better parents and partners. Join us as we catch up with fatherhood specialist Eddie Harris from the Ready Kids Real Dads program. Come on. The Real Dads program is a fatherhood program that focuses on guys that are incarcerated or coming from that extreme type of a lifestyle. And what we offer is support and resources to guys and building their relationships with their children as well as with the mothers of their children. So how does it work? How does, that, how does it work in the, in the prison and how does it work here in the community? Well, in, in the jail we do a, a weekly group and uh, we have a small group at the jail so we can keep it more intimate, intimate and more trustworthy. And guys can, re, uh, they can request our program in the community by just simply getting in touch with Eddie Harris at, at uh, Ready Kids. Let's talk about in the jail. What happens in the program? What do you do? Well, what we basically do, we have a curriculum that we use. It's called Inside Outside Dads. It's from the National Fatherhood Initiative. Mm -hmm. And we use that as a basis or a foundation for the work that we strive to do in the jail. And once we get guys to kind of like focusing on themselves and being willing to talk about themselves, what I try to do is to create an environment where guys feel comfortable talking about what their challenges are, what their difficulties are, what even even what the things that they do very well are, you know, and just building that environment where guys can just feel comfortable about what keeps me coming here. Right. You know, why am I here now? You know, how can I do life better? How can I become a better father? Because the solution is definitely not within me. Their solution is within them. Well and this is this is such an important need sure. in communities and in our community. I mean, talk about that. A lot of these guys never had a dad of their own. Well, I think, I think what I find out is that, Terry, a lot of guys have never had anybody to really listen to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it gives them an opportunity to express what's important to them, what their likes are, what their dislikes are. And hopefully the, the environment or the atmosphere is one that you won't be judged by whatever your thoughts are. Right. You know? So that's a big deal sure. for you to build a relationship so that they feel yeah. that they can do that because their past has never really made that possible. So talk about how important that relationship is. Well, you know, relationships, are, I feel like, are at the core of everything that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, relationships. And I think that guides the processes. So what I strive to do is to share with myself talk about my challenges, talk about what my difficulties have been, talk about my missteps, so they feel more comfortable speaking about theirs. Right, you and, you, and you, you did make some mistakes in your youth. Sure, sure, of course. You know, I mean, may not came from extreme circumstances, but made some decisions that put extreme circumstances in my life. Yeah. You know. But now, You've turned that into something that's very positive for other people. And then when you're talking to these dads, they do trust you because you're not making it up. You're not pretending to understand sure. something you couldn't possibly understand. Sure. And what I'm learning is that I may just be the guy that plants the seed. I may not be the guy that waters it. So in every situation, I try to look for, okay, what is my 
situation with this particular man. I don't look for one blanket to cover all these guys the same way. Yeah. So I, even though we're in a group, I still deal with them as individuals. I try to see what it is that's going to take them to, to go a little further. Yeah. I was first introduced to the Real Dads program when I was incarcerated at the Almore County Charlottesville Regional Jail. And I just wanted to figure out what it was about. Kids that have absentee fathers um, have higher rates of poverty, have higher rates of teen pregnancy. They often have substance abuse um, issues and end up incarcerated themselves. And what this program does is it stops that cycle. To me, what informs everything we do is community safety balanced with the fair treatment of offenders. And one of the things that Eddie's program really helps us with as prosecutors is the fair treatment of offenders part of our job so that we can transition them back into the community and help them be productive members of the community, which is what they all want. So we've been talking about the importance of building relationships with the dads, but you've also been building relationships within the jail with the staff. Talk about the importance of that and, and one of the really great outcomes of those relationships. Yeah, well, you know, taking the opportunity to, to build relationships is invaluable. So in the process of building relationships with the staff at the jail, we've gotten the opportunity to have the kids come in quarterly and, and meet with their fathers on a contact type of a visit where they can come in and play games. We also have structured events for them, you know, they come in, take pictures, make picture frames and different things like that. But that doesn't happen without building the relationships with the jail staff. And that's how this thing works, I think. Talk about some of the different issues that different fathers come to you with. Well, you know, guys have all different types of, of situations going on. And sometimes it's multiples. You know, uh, some guys are just insecure. Mm -hmm. Some guys are, are dealing with substance abuse issues. Mm -hmm. Some guys are, you know, are just fragile, have dealt with trauma through their, through their childhood. Mm -hmm. So that's still playing havoc in their life. So the thing for me to do is, again, to, to try to build a comfortable enough relationship with these guys where they are trusted enough to go in, you know, and, 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 and access what it is that's going on with them, what's blocking them, what's holding me back. You ask them about that, but you also ask them, what are your dreams? You sure. ask them. What's your dreams? You know, what's how do you goals? see a win? Yeah. What do you have, what's that that you say? Well, the thing that I want to ask guys is that, okay, what is a win for you? You know, because a win for me may be different than what a win for Terry is. Right. So, and then I want to know how are you participating in making that win a reality? Because a lot of times when I hear myself talk, I'd be like, oh, no, that's not lining up with that. That don't make sense. And that's how we get those crazy results sometimes because what we're thinking and what we're actually doing, it's not really lining up. Right. And no one's ever asked you. Sure. You know, no one ever sure. has ever asked them. Because it's like... Right. If, if, you know, I want guys to be able to make their goals, their dreams, their aspirations, their relationship with themselves a priority. Because, you know, it's no way that I can love my kid more than I'm loving myself. So I have to learn that love for myself. And in order for me to love myself, I have to get a relationship and know myself. Real Dads is about confronting resentment, regret. It's about confronting you know your father if he wasn't there. It's about confronting the father you wasn't. And I know I wanted to be a responsible father. It's kind of like therapy, you know. It's just very helpful for them to be there and to actually understand, you know, what you're going through as a dad, as a husband, boyfriend, you know. Coming from these areas, like where we came from, I'm just happy for him because he could have easily veered off and lived the life that I once lived a negative lifestyle, but he was a little stronger in his mind, and he's been doing the right thing, graduated, married with kids, so I'm very proud of him, and, and I'm glad he's still in the program, and you know, I use the same thing that he used. I try to stay with Mr. Harris, and Mr. Harris has been there for me and my son, and it's great. Why do you do this? I do it because it's, it's important to me as a community, as a nation, we're actually suffering from the lack of folks really engaging and keeping the generations connected. A lot of these fathers are, are like my son's age or, or, or younger, you know, so 
to be able to have some type of an influence in a positive way in their lives makes a great difference to me. It makes me feel like I'm really doing something that's making a difference because I know good givers are great givers. That reminds me too, you have a business. Sure. You are the co-creator and co-publisher of Vinegar Hill Magazine sure. with Sarah Davenport. Talk about this magazine and why you think it's so important that the two of you are working together to bring it to the community. In Vinegar Hill, a lot of people know was um, it, it, it was an African American community that mm -hmm. was destroyed and demolished, and a lot of the culture was destroyed along with with the uh, neighborhood. So what we want to do, in the essence, is like we want to bring the art plus business equals success equals freedom model to to, to the forefront. And working with a with a younger guy, you know, I get his goals, his aspirations, and his wisdom. And I, you know, we get to bounce stuff off of each other. I think that's something that doesn't happen a lot these days. And I think we need more of that because it's a generational disconnect. Yeah. And I think we, we really suffering from that. Talk about some of the different writers who contribute to the magazine. We've had Sonia Montavo, Dr. George Bates, Maxine Holland, Andrea Douglas mm -hmm. does uh, great articles for us. We had Dr. William Harris, uh -huh. who was the first uh, Dean of African American Affairs at UVA. He's written several articles for us. You're not leaving it, anybody it, out. It, this it, is good. It, it, goes, it goes on and on and on. And, and it's somebody that I'm missing, please blame it on my head and not my heart. <laughs> you know, because I really appreciate oh, what you've done. You well, know. That's, and it's, it's a quarterly magazine, and people can pick up the physical version of it at the Jefferson School African American Heritage that's Center, sure, and then sure. there's a digital version. Sure. You say this work with the magazine and your work with Real Dads really connects to one another. Tell sure. me, tell me how, how that works for you. Well, you know, we always talk about we want to make a better better life. You know, and I'm always thinking about, damn, I would like to see something better. So the, the deal is if I want to see something better and I'm not seeing it, create it. Do your version of it. So we get these people to write these articles and they have something to share with the community. So we work with guys and real dads. They have talent. They have skills. They have something to offer this community. And if we just keep on shelving them and keep putting them in those boxes, mm -hmm. they'll never get a chance to share it and we'll never get a chance to benefit from it. Right. You know, so do we really have the luxury of throwing somebody away? I don't think so. Me being, you know, financially stable, me having a stable home, me, you know, being with my kids, me not being stressful, you know, that's being successful to me. And that's what I tell Eddie that I wanted to be. He's always been a great mentor to me and always been there for me when I needed his help. When I left from out of that jail, I left out of there with a sense of hope, with a sense of faith, and I had something inside of me that was pushing me to be ambitious towards my goals. Come in. Today we're going to hear about a program at the UVA Clinical yeah, Skills Center that teaches med students to better connect oh, with their okay. patients. As part of the curriculum, community members are trained to portray a variety of patient scenarios, giving students the tools they need to be competent and compassionate doctors. Join us as we learn about the Standardized Patient Program. Come on! The Standardized Patient Program is really critical to helping health profession students. I, we're here in the School of Medicine, but I do want to share that we actually work with students from other health professions as well. And it's critical because so much of training to become a health professional is in the clinical environment, which can be very unpredictable and actually unstandardized. Mm -hmm. And so standardized patients actually give us an opportunity to teach skill development and also assess skill development in a much mm -hmm. more standardized way. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about doing that? What exactly happens? So we uh, recruit standardized patients who are just normal, everyday people from the community. They come to us, um, we train them to portray a particular patient, and um, they'll either work in a teaching scenario with a student where the student might be learning how to do a heart exam or to how to take a history on a patient with chest pain, something like that. 
And um, we also have them um, working assessments where we're actually able to test whether or not the students we're sending out into the world are actually able to you know, work as diagnosticians and clinicians. Why is this so important? It's, it has proven to be such a great program and such a necessary program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I think is most valuable about it is that it's really the application of, of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can read, this is what a patient looks like when they're coming in with a heart attack. But if you see a patient and you're, you know, it's chest pain, is it a heart attack, is it something else, how do you work through that? How do you diagnose your patient? And also, how do you talk to them? You know, if they come in and they say, I'm scared, you know, what's, what's happening to me? Am I going to be okay? That's not something that always comes naturally. That is a learned skill, mm -hmm. you know, your bedside manner. Yeah. And I think it's that uh, opportunity to learn in a safe environment mm -hmm. um, that allows students of all kind to feel more comfortable um, really trying to apply the skills that they've learned right. in a classroom or a small group setting and being able to get feedback from their teachers. And right. I would say the standardized patients are part of that teaching team. Yeah, so definitely. our standardized patients do uh, help students learn about uh, how they're communicating information, how they're um, really, the, even their body language mm -hmm. during an interaction helps mm -hmm. the patient feel more or less that they're engaged or comfortable with the encounter as the, the student is really trying to really learn the role of the health professional. Right. Well, and give us some more examples of what yeah. they might encounter. Sure. So um, you might have a young woman with a severe headache and you have to um, bring her out of her shell and recognize that she's in a lot of pain, but still get the information you need. Mm -hmm. You might have an angry patient who's you know been waiting for 45 minutes and you have yeah. to figure out how to yeah. navigate that. Um, as Mary Ellen said, dealing with other health professionals, what information do they need from you? What information do you need from them? How do you treat each other you know, respectfully in the professional environment. And I think, so really what drives the selection of what types of patients is our curriculum. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of the communication piece, so after the encounter, there are other components of these uh, activities where students are learning how to do an oral presentation to a member of the healthcare team mm -hmm. or write a note that would go into the electronic record so right. that, again, other health professionals caring for the patient that they just saw would understand right. what the patient's Context mm -hmm. is, situation is, complaint is, and what the patient needs. Come in. Hi, Mr. Smith. My name is Richard Bayless. I'm a third year medical student, and hey. I'll be talking to you today. Okay. How's it going? Uh, all right. Um, my back has been hurting. Gotcha. It's a I lot like so acting so. In, in theater, but it's much more intimate because you are actually interacting with another human being in time and space like together simultaneously. If the students are actually supposed to be figuring out something like a diagnosis, you have to be really sure you've memorized all, all the symptoms pretty specifically. It's really fun to see sort of, you know, the nervous first year with maybe shaky hands with the stethoscope or you know, they have pauses, they don't really have it all down yet. But by the fourth year, they're so seasoned. I mean, they're, they're diagnosing, they know how to do things in a set amount of time. Um, it's just kind of fun to see that progression. So the patients are simulating heart attacks or chest pains. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost everything that you could mm -hmm. encounter, right? Yeah, right? Everything from headaches to toe pain. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's really looking at really all the systems of the body and again looking at what are the students learning in the curriculum? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the either common conditions or typical conditions mm -hmm. that we want them not only to identify but be able to distinguish from other common presentations? And I think right. that's a key aspect that Laura talked about. It's that reasoning process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, not just um, obtaining information or giving information to a patient, but how do you use that in learning how to work through you know, diagnostically right, through a right. case to figure out what the patient wants, what the patient needs, mm -hmm. and how best to come to a shared understanding about that. Yeah, and Absolutely. there's there's so much more involved, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in diagnosing something and then and the steps you take from there. Right. right. One of the very first things they do actually is a simulation with a uh, where they think they're just learning about something, you know, um, and then a standardized patient runs in the room and says, help, help, my husband has collapsed. Yeah. You, you know CPR, 
come help me, and they have to run down the room and <laughs> do CPR in this man. So yeah. yeah. And, and I think <laughs> that scenario that. shows how we work with other uh, uh, technologies uh -huh. in simulation too. So that actually takes advantage of our simulation center and the mm -hmm. mannequins, but mm -hmm. the students really start through an interaction with a standardized patient. Right. So um, the students actually work with standardized patients throughout, the, uh, before they go into a clinical learning environment mm -hmm. in a course that's called Foundations of Clinical Medicine, mm -hmm. which is the first 18 months of their medical school. Mm -hmm. And importantly, the other aspect of this is we're preparing them also for a national licensing exam, mm -hmm. which actually also uses standardized patients. Well, and so what has the response been from, from students? How do they feel about the program? I think they really enjoy their time down here. I think that, as I said, is it a chance to apply what you're learning? You know, you can get kind of swamped with the books, and then you can come down here and I think maybe remind yourself, oh, yeah, this is why I came to medical school, right? right? right, right. <laughs> to see patients. Do the students ever get stumped when they're trying to diagnose a patient? So I, really the goal is not to trick a student. Just um, in that first day. <laughs> <laughs> but rather to uh, prepare them well. So mm -hmm. when we have a case that doesn't go as we intended, we do a lot of really mm -hmm. uh, debriefing among the team to say, what information did we not provide in the case? Mm -hmm. um, what were the questions we were asking the student to be able to do in this scenario? So the goal is not to find some fascinating case that they'll never encounter as a clinician right. or to uh, pull out that trick diagnosis. The goal is to write a case that's as authentic as it can be. Mm -hmm. And then again, meet the expectations because as a school of medicine, we have expectations right. that we want to ensure for all of our patients right. that our students are ready to do these things. All of these examinations are filmed, uh, which gives us the opportunity to see ourselves through someone else's eyes. Um, and it also shows us how we behave under pressure. So let me have you just lie back here. Sure. You come into a patient encounter room and you know that it's a case, that, that it has been pre-written and that this is an actor. But uh, these, these standardized patients take it very seriously and oftentimes you'll, you'll uh, have a very real human interaction where the patient may be going through a very difficult situation and you have to be able to show empathy and understanding. They all have like different ways that they kind of play themselves and it's, it's really good practice getting to kind of experience each of those ways so that when you do get out in the hospital, I, I felt pretty well prepared because of that. Who can be a standardized patient? What are the qualifications? Yeah. Anyone? I think our youngest SP ever was, I think, six years old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and our oldest is about 85. Yeah. So, yeah, anyone. We tend to attract a lot of people with a background either in drama, in the arts, um, or education. Mm -hmm. And also, actually, a lot of retired um, medical professionals, nurses, right. speech pathologists. Yeah. But we have SPs who are stay-at-home moms, yeah. One's a beekeeper, <laughs> um, so it's it's yeah. And talk about the training because yeah. they receive you yeah. know very significant very significant training yeah. too. Um, up to sixteen hours training each patient to go into the room and interact with the with the students. And a lot of that is sort of you know what if because mm -hmm. no one has exactly the same interviewing style. So. Right. Right. Um, and still the standardization is important because you can imagine we want every standardized patient who's portraying a case, a right. patient with certain characteristics th that each student group that has that experience is having the same experience. Right. And then for assessment for sure we want to be applying the same criteria for all students. Right. That's sure. the word standardized. Right. It's right. very very right. important. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Laura, so what really makes a good standardized patient? I think that some of our best standardized patients um, are people who are really great observers. Mm -hmm. um, they can kind of simultaneously, you know, retain all the facts of the case, watch the student to see kind of what behaviors they're exhibiting that are either successful or less successful in developing that patient doctor bond. Um, and then they also have to kind of self-observe to mm -hmm discern how they're reacting to the students so that they can give them meaningful feedback. And a lot of what we um, ask the standardized patients to do is give feedback about, again, students' emerging communication skills. Mm -hmm. And I think they bring their experience not only from the training, but as human beings and as patients to help right. students understand, again, whether the way the words, the mm -hmm. way the words were said or the body language may have not conveyed um, empathy 
mm -hmm. um, an understanding, mm -hmm. an openness to the patient's concern. As you know, we're trying to ensure that students understand the importance of that shared relationship right. in a patient yeah. encounter. It, ca it can't just be about science. Right, sure. that's exactly you know, right. Exactly, it can't yeah. be. This is really one of the few places that they can hear. Here's how your bedside manner struck me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you said this, when you, you know, put your hand on my knee and said, I understand you're right. upset, but we're here to help you, that really made me feel right. comfortable. Each and every time you go in there throughout your medical education, you actually uh, see yourself uh, becoming a little less clueless, uh, a little less nervous and, and unsure, a little more competent and a little more confident. Um, and over time, you start to you start to be convinced that maybe you know, maybe one day I'll be somebody who knows who knows what they're doing, right? There's just something wonderful knowing that you were kind of part of that learning experience. Um, you've given them feedback, and you feel as though they're going to be the kind of doctors you want to go to. That's it for this week. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.